10, 4, it says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Amen? Let's say that together. Let's read it together. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Okay, today, uh, the title is Spiritual Warfare. The battles are intensifying, but they're already won in our favor. Amen? Does anybody know that our Savior was born into a world of conflict? He was born into a world where there was a lot of hostility. He was born into a political maelstrom, in, in, in a small one, but it, was, but it was still assigned against him. Um, when he was born in Bethlehem, and we know that in Matthew 2, in verse 2, it said that these magi, they were on the three kings of, from the Orient. They were on their way to see Jesus. They passed through this area, this region, and they were, um, and as they were going through Bethlehem or near Bethlehem, they, they had said that they were looking for the king of the Jews who was in Bethlehem. They said, we've seen his star in the east. We're coming to worship him. And then when Herod, the king, how many thinks a king is probably a political position? Kind of equivalent to a president or a monarch of some kind, the king. Okay, the king was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. So they, he, they were in Jerusalem looking for the king, heading to Bethlehem, king of the Jews. And so what did, what did Herod order to be done? Everybody remember? Yeah, they didn't come back the way that they were told. They were warned of God, so they came back another way. And it says in verse, um, what verse was that? Two, 216. I went too many verse, too many pages over. 216. Don't you just love it when your pages stick together? Okay. Uh, this is talking about Herod, verse 16. When Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, he was exceedingly wroth. You know when you don't wipe the counter down and clean it up real good the way your wife looks at you? That same thing. Same thing. Exceedingly wroth. And so, uh, and he slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coasts thereof. All the coasts thereof from two years old and under. And I read something that somebody thought that might have been around 20, 24 children that were slaughtered. I don't know what it was, but... One child is a bloodbath if you're the mama. If you're the mama, that's a bloodbath. That's horrible. And so he was, there was a king who was opposed to Jesus when he was born. At birth. He had political warfare at birth. Now that's kind of, that's pretty rough. And so then he lived his life on the earth. We know that everywhere he went, there was either uh, revivals or riots. And the... Uh, we know that he, when he ended his earth, or ended his, his earthly life on the earth, he was tortured, he brutalized, he was crucified on a cruel cross. Um, he was the center of the conflict. And, he, and it was made into a political conflict. Did you all know that? That the religious leaders took him to the magistrate, Pontius Pilate, and they said, we need you to deal with this man. And they said, he claims to be a king of the Jews. And any king, any man claiming to be a king is not a friend of Caesar. You better believe Pontius Pilate, as soon as you mention Caesar, who was the, he was the uh, dictator of the world, uh, the then known world, when, he mentioned, when they mention Caesar, all of a sudden his political mind's kicking in and says, oh, wow, I better deal with this and deal with it strongly or I'm going to lose my position. Right? And so it was made political. And so they tortured him, and they, they killed him, and we know that it was all done uh, on, with purpose, and it was planned beforehand of God. And the Bible even says, had the enemy known what he was doing, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But he was too stupid to know what was going on. <clears throat> There's a lot, of, a lot of things assigned against us, church, from birth till the grave. A lot of assignments, a lot of attacks. And it says in the word, and I forgot to put down the place where it is, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. Right? Anybody remember reading that in the word? Many are the afflictions. Does anybody besides Steve Cox 
know what the Greek word for afflictions is here. I, I looked, just found this out a couple days ago. I was like, wow, that's pretty wild. Did anybody ever see Indiana Jones with, uh, what was his name? Harrison Ford, yeah. In the, the, I don't know if it was the first one or the second one, but he was looking for the Staff of Ra. Does anybody remember that? The Staff of Ra. He was looking for that. It was going to shine a light. It was a certain height and all this stuff. It had a stone on the end of it, the Staff of Ra. Well, Ra in Egypt, ancient Egypt, was their number one deity that they worshipped, and it was the god of light, god with a small g. And isn't it interesting that a totally false god is called the god of light? What does the Bible say that, that Satan himself transforms himself or presents himself as an angel of light, right? So here we see way back in Egyptian times in antiquity, they were worshiping a god of light. They were worshiping the false god, although there was a true god of light, and his name was Yahweh, but they didn't know. And so the word Ra there means evil, malignant, bad, sad, hurtful, unkind, misery, distress, wrong, calamity, and pain. So it says many are the Ra's. This is a raw subject here. You know what I'm talking about? Many are the Ra's of God. Many are the Ra's of God, or not of God, but of the children of God. Of the righteous ones. Many are the afflictions, the raw. We're, we face a lot of things that are there a lot of calamity, a lot of pain, a lot of distress, wrong. Can anybody agree with any of that? You've had difficulties in your life? The older you are, the more difficulties you're going to say, oh, yeah. Yeah, let me tell you about some of them. Sit down here with me. Pull up a, pull up a sit down and we'll talk. <laughs> People love to talk about their problems. All right. Has anybody noticed that we're in a season of political ads? And there, I don't watch that much TV, but I've, what little bit I do watch, I'm like, tell Joe, John, tell Joe Donnelly what he's doing wrong. <laughs> I see a lot of that. And so, uh, but there's a lot of politics, and it's, it can be wearisome. But actually, there's, what is going on, this is not a political battle. It's actually a spiritual battle. When Herod wanted Jesus killed, it wasn't a political battle. It was, but it Behind it was a driving demonic force. Amen? And same way, at the end of Jesus' life, when he was on the cross, it wasn't the, uh, it wasn't the Romans that wanted him dead so much as it was the demonic powers that were in, in power at that time. Okay. Each election that we have been facing brings with it a, more, a higher level of intensity of warfare. Has anybody noticed that? It just keeps escalating. Each time there's more to lose and more to gain. Each time that there's an election. Proverbs 29.2 says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. So it really is critical that the people that we have ruling over us, they may not be believers, but they have respect to the believers and what the believers believe. Amen? And so, uh, has anybody heard of Lance Wall now? Anybody heard of him? He's, he's been used by God as a prophet for, I don't know, a lot of years. I didn't really know him too well or know of him until the last few years. And then the things I've read, I've been really impressed with. Um, we're going to play a video of his. Anybody seen that on the last week? You've seen it, Janetta? Okay, we're going to play seven minutes of it, roughly. And it's actually like a, almost an 18-minute video. So if you want to watch it, I encourage you to watch it when you get home, watch the whole thing. It would just take too much time here. Uh, but what he's talking about, the part that we cut out was a lot of intro stuff. And he was talking about, uh, there's been a couple other videos that came out. Bridget was told me about the first one. And President Trump met with the, the Christian leaders of did you know that he has been doing that since he's been in office? Did you all know that? And what is, I think it's like monthly meetings, and they all come together. It's about 100 to 120, and they gather together, and they talk about the nation. They pray for the nation. Did that happen in the previous eight years? There was a whole lot of Muslims that were invited into the White House. But I don't know that there were any Christian meetings, you know, believers, leaders that were brought in. 
So I'm telling you that there's been a huge shift in, in our nation. And what I'm going to talk about today, it definitely has a lot of political overtones, but it's a spiritual battle. This is a spiritual battle. And so we're going to turn these lights off, and we're going to uh, catch a little bit of Lance speaking until he comes to a point of, of prayer, and then we'll stop. Go ahead. That today. Because I don't want to just be up there smiling around for a photo op so I can show you, hey, look, I'm in the White House. If I don't have a reason to be there, I don't want to be there. But I'm telling you something. I, now I want to be there because I would, have, I would have trumpeted this without it being leaked. I would have just come and told you. That night I would have told you. So why does Trump say this? He says they're going to reverse the progress. Part of this is because some of the things I've done for you. Andy, Trump says, why are they that? going to be so Why are they mad? Because that? of things I've done for you. He said, honestly, I've done it also for me and my family. The decisions he made about Jerusalem. Uh, the part that I forgot to tell you all about was that in this meeting he, with the pastors and ministers, at a certain point he asked all the media to leave. So there was nothing to be gained by what he had to say at this point. Okay, it was just him and the ministers. And so he, then he starts pouring his heart into them about, uh, they're, they're talking about impeaching him. They're talking about, he's saying that every law that he has enacted is, uh, is probably going to be rescinded or revoked or undone in some way or whatever. So there's a lot at stake. So this is kind of where Lance was talking about now he wants to be at the White House and, and engage in the battle much more than he has. Hey, sorry. Decisions he made about ending the, about attacking the social media attack on conservatives. These things he's doing for himself and his family, but he's done them clearly for us. He said, this November 6th is very much a referendum, not only on me. Catch this. It's a referendum on your religion. Notice, this is pure Cyrus out of the Bible. He's saying to the Jews, I'm standing in the gap for your faith. Are you standing in the gap for your faith? I'm fighting for you guys. Are you fighting for you guys? This is the Feast of Purim on November 6th. This is the feast. This, this is like the Feast of Purim. This is when Billy Graham's coffin was laid out in the, in the, as, in the Capitol, and it was put in a state of honor, and, and all the politicians came. When was Billy Graham's coffin laid out perpendicular in the state Capitol? And when did Trump go up and tap it five times and pray? It was during the Feast of Purim. I'm telling you, Billy Graham was prophesying from his grave, saying, you guys better wake up because when I go, a new era starts in America. And it's not the era of extended mercy without conditions. It's the period in which you will contend for the faith that was given to you. Contend for your freedom. Trump said, this is a referendum on your religion. And with that, it's a referendum on free speech and the First Amendment. And you watch the First Amendment and the Second Amendment are linked together. That uh, your free speech will, is, is already being broken by the very platforms that we're trying desperately to communicate on right now, by, by the social media platforms, by the tech companies. You're one election away from losing everything you've got, Trump said. Wake up, church. You're one. I want you to share this. Share this. Share this. You know why? Because if we don't become a network that is communicating with each other, Nobody else is raising up the trumpet. You are one election from losing everything you've got, Christian. And then Trump repeated a comment he said was made by Robert Jeffers, who's down here, First Baptist in Dallas, who's, who's been pushing back and defending Trump against the questions of evangelical leaders. What knucklehead, mush for brains, evangelical leaders are trying to, to, uh, to overthrow Trump. What, it, you've got to ask yourself, it's a special kind of dumb that is oppositional to Trump and calling yourself a Christian. But what he says, he says that Jeffers, who is pushing back on the evangelical leaders who are questioning support for Trump in the face of his decade-old moral failings. I want to see every Christian under a microscope for what they've done over the last decade, by the way. And he said this, he said, I had the great Robert Jeffers back there. And he said, hello, Robert, and he waves at him. You know what he said to me? He said, and here's what he said about me. Now, I want you to hear the humility in Trump, the authenticity in Trump. Jeffers said, 
you know, Trump may not be the perfect human being, but he's been the greatest leader in terms of supporting Christianity. He may not be the perfect human being, but he's the greatest leader for Christians, on behalf of Christians, in defense of Christians. Every other president took our votes and pushed us out of the White House because he didn't want to be embarrassed or encumbered by us. This guy brings us in. So here's what Trump said. Look, hopefully, 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 I've proven that to be a fact in terms of the second part, being the greatest leader for Christianity. Not the first part, being a perfect human being. You hear the humility in that? And it's authentic. This was done and he was not wanting reporters there. What he was saying is, I'm not a perfect human being. I've sinned, I've made mistakes. But hopefully, for your religion, for you guys, for your faith, I've been the best Christian leader or the leader protecting Christians and defending you that's ever existed. And it's absolutely true. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you will raise up at this very moment a new company. I've got 2.6 thousand people watching. They'll share this. Lord, I ask for the zeal of the Lord of hosts to touch everyone, the same zeal that, 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 that possesses me for this president will be in every one of them and that we will multiply to 2.6 million people. And I pray, Lord, that you will create a wineskin out of us, a net that will be able to let division and differences pass through, but we will capture the harvest, the harvest of votes, the harvest of influence, the harvest of persuasion, the harvest of spiritual authority that, Lord, I ask you to command angels right now to tear the veil. I'm asking you, Father, I'm, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus to literally take the veil that is over the mind of America, that, the, that is on the left, that is working through the New York assault on Trump through their southern district and through the Mueller probe, and tear off that veil right now. Tear off that veil in Jesus' name. I ask you, Lord, to loose angels that are going to move in every single congressional district, in every single state, in every battle. They call them battleground states. I pray that the battle will shift in the heavens over those states right now. And that these believers are going to go, their footsteps are going to be thundering in the, in, and echoing in the corridors of hell. I pray for you to raise up a people right now that are not going to be asleep in the garden like the disciples, but they will be awakened. And if the leaders do not respond, then you will raise up new leaders as you did in America's first revolution, how you took ordinary farmers and merchants and bankers and bookmakers and you put them in positions where they had to, they had to contend with the reins of history. I pray for you to raise up out of my audience right here, along with me, new voices, completely new to this game, but honest and earnest and anointed voices that are going to cause a coalition of power to come together. And I pray, Father, that the fear of the Lord and the authority of, of the name of Jesus is going to be exalted, that Jesus will be made magnificent. And I ask you, Lord, to give to us signs and wonders, that you will stretch out your hands, as you did in the book of Acts, that you will perform the supernatural in order to assist us, Lord, in what we cannot do without you. We pray for the extension of mercy over America for the sake of your church, for the sake of Israel. And for the sake of the nations, Lord, the sheep nations, the, the weak church around them, let there be a trumpeted warning that echoes and reverberates in each of our hearts that we are right now entering a critical season where, like the Feast of Purim, we must spiritually arm ourselves and go forth and contend for the right to exist as a people in our own nations. In Jesus' mighty name, and I June was just uh, reminding me that the Feast of Purim came from Esther and when you know the one night with the king, the, the movie, and I think it was a book also. So um, anyway, it's we're we're called. We are here to contend for what is right and holy and good. We're here to say no to the enemy. We're here to draw lines in the sand and say no more. You've taken enough. Uh, back in 2015. There was a very le legitimately potential uh, collapse of the economy that we were facing. 
And the body of Christ, it was the Shemitah fallout, the Shemitah effect. And we were facing all that, and it was looming over us. And the body of Christ gathered together. God raised up voices that were proclaiming, wake up, church, wake up. And people stood and prayed and repented and asked God for mercy. And it, went, it just blew right on by. We didn't see anything happen from that. I'm so thankful. Does anybody remember the, uh, uh, the presidential election in 2016? How difficult that was and all the prayer and fasting and, and calling out to God and calling upon him for mercy. And had the election swung the other way, it could have been really, 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 really bad. It could have been very horrible for, for believers. Then there was the Neil Gorsuch who was appointed as the Justice of the Supreme Court. How many knows that was a pretty intense battle right there? And so we prayed and we believed and we stood and we declared. Now we have Brett Kavanaugh that is looming in the balance and got such a short window of time that that's got to take place you know if 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 the president is uh if if the depending on how the election turns out it could be a very very window of time to make sure that this is going to uh that this he's going to be appointed and then we have the midterm elections in november the 6th then our president has done things with the uh um, of jerusalem putting our embassy in Jerusalem and telling the Jews, you have a friend in the White House, and he has defunded, uh, I don't know, I don't, not fully, I don't believe, but he's defunded to a pretty large extent the uh, Planned Parenthood, the biggest abortion industry in the world. And uh, I don't know about you, but looking at where we are right now, it causes me to have a much greater or graver sense of responsibility that we are responsible. This is our shift. We're on. We're on duty. We can't wait for the next shift to come on duty and let them pray. This is our shift. And we must pray. We must seek God. And we must, uh, the, I heard somebody make the comment years ago, evil flourishes when good men or righteous men do nothing. And what I have noticed to be true, this is just my observation, that most of humanity, believers or not, it doesn't seem to matter. Uh, we're going through life, and we have everybody has different qualifiers of what they would call a good life. Everything's good. Everything's peaceful. The bills are paid. Got money in the bank. Whatever your good is, but life is good. And then something will happen to upset your apple cart to dump it over. And then all of a sudden, people get worked up into a lather. They're they're just just all up in the air, and their drawers are in a bunch, and everything's uptight. And they're just, you know, everything's crazy and everybody's talking, talking, talking about stuff. And then we, then we, re, we respond, we react. We call, it's a call to action. We do something. And then the, the immediate urgency of the moment passes. And then we just kind of slip back into like, whew, that was a close one. And then, and then status quo sets in again. And everybody just kind of goes back to the norm. And how many knows that is not the plan of God? We are watchmen on the wall 24-7. We are watching, we are praying, we're believing. We don't have to wait for a tragedy or for a calamity to hit our nation. We need to be ready now, long before it ever hits. Uh, this is not a political war, it's a spiritual war. Ephesians 6.12 says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and rulers of, of darkness in high places and or rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. It is, not a, it is not a battle that we wage with one another. So we cannot, we, we cannot, we dare not get into name calling. Liberals, uh, nuts, <laughs> ungodly, uh, profane, whatever it is we want to label people, we don't want to get into that. We just know that there is a, a serious opposition in the spirit going on right now. And, the, and you know where it says we wrestle not. We don't ever want to be charged, justly charged with the first, part of that, the first part of that verse. We wrestle not. We, that can be said about a lot of churches and a lot of people. I'm going to say that again. It can be said against a lot of churches and a lot of people, we wrestle not. They wrestle not. In other words, they're not praying. In other words, they don't pray. In other words, they don't intercede. In other words, they just, they, they just, they're, 
Well, leave it to somebody else. We elected this guy two years ago. He'll take care of it. Hey, he's calling upon, he's calling upon the men of God around our nation. I need some help. If we're going to continue this work, we need some help here. And this is uh, this statement that I said about not wrestling, it, that's not true about this body. No way. And I am thankful for that, that we have got, uh, I'm not saying that every person's praying, because I don't believe that at all. But I'm saying that this is a praying body who prays intently. It says to pray for kings. Paul, Paul said, I think it was to Timothy, he said, first of all, I wish that you pray for kings, for, all, for those that are in authority, for all men. And he, and he goes on to talk about that. It's a beautiful scripture. I've got it memorized. It's a beautiful. But we need to be praying for people that are over us. Amen? All right. Um, one thing about prayer is that, you know, it's just like the Shemitah thing. It was, it was definitely a danger hovering over our nation we all prayed against it. We called out for mercy from God. It would have ravaged our nation. It would have. We called out for mercy. God granted mercy. And guess what? Nobody is the wiser. Nobody knows how much time you spend in prayer. Nobody knows how you contended with God for our nation. Nobody knows about your intercession except God. And that's all that really matters. That's all that matters. When, when there is uh, the evil, when the, the evil one has in, evil... Uh, appointed against your family, and Bridget and I have taken to prayer. We just started last night. We see some things going on, and we're standing against it. We're not making a big deal out of it. But I'm going to tell you, the, most, the people who are the most godly, sometimes they miss things, and sometimes they have blinders on their eyes. And so we have to stand, and we don't have to necessarily confront things straight, straight up forward, but we can contend in prayer and believe, and that's what we're doing. Okay. Um, 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 um. Okay, two years ago, now backtrack with me if you would, when right before the election, there was a lot of intensity, a lot of prayer, and the polls say this, and it's going to be a cakewalk, it's going to be a bunny election, and, and the, the, the opponents of the pre current president, they got kind of cocky. They got a little bit, they were actually gloating before the election. And when it, when it all came down, we see how the election turned around. It was, it was totally, they were hit totally blindsided. The media was especially, I mean, they all were. Even the, the one who was defeated, she wouldn't even come out of her hiding for several days because she was so exasperated. You know what it puts me in mind of is... The Philistines had Goliath out there against David. And you can just see the troops sitting back there, and Goliath goes out for 40 days. He taunted the, the host of Israel. And, they're just, and the troops are sitting back there saying, Tell him, Goliath, tell him, Big G, let him have it. Blow him some armpit smell. You know, you can just see how that goes. And they're, and they're just harassing them. And it said they mocked them. They taunted them for 40 days. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking Goliath was probably pretty reeking, you know. He probably needed a, a bath. I bet in that 40 days he didn't take a bath. So he's a big guy. And, you know, he anyway, that's another story. But here they are. They're cocky. They're arrogant. And then they're like, yeah, we're going to show them what, what we're made of and what they're not made of. And then they get this little redheaded, he's a Baxter. His name was David Baxter. <laughs> and he came out on the battlefield, and he had his five smooth rocks, a redheaded guy. He wasn't even in high, high teenagers, like 18 or 19. He was more like 13 or 14. He goes out there with five rocks, and they're laughing, they're mocking, and they, whoosh, boom, and he send, sends that rock flying and hits that Goliath right between the eyes. And you just see him standing there and just swaying around like, oh, oh, they might got any Tylenol. <laughs> and then he, kaboom, he goes down. And can you see this scene? And, and everybody in the background, just like the last election, they're like, their eyes get bigger and bigger. It's like, what just happened? What just happened? I'm talking about the people, the media, the, 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 the supporters, 
back here, and they're all freaking out. They're crestfallen. They're like, they're, they're like at a loss. Then there's fear, and then there's terror, and then they run like the dickens. And I believe that there was a spiritual, very big demonic spirit of fear, maybe a host of de- demonic spirits of fear, that were hovering over the Israelites. And when David slew Goliath, every one of those demons, whoosh, and they latched a hold of the Philistines. You know, the devil loves to torment people. He doesn't care who it is. He just loves to torment anybody. And then they took off. They had the same fear that the, the Israelites had now was on the, the Philistines. Okay, but how many knows the battle wasn't over? I had some discussion with some people. I was consulting the big guns this morning, and I didn't come up with a lot of answers because it's Bible trivia. But I said, didn't Goliath have some brothers? And he did. He had, he had one brother. His name was, oh, I wrote it down here. His name was Lami, Lami, and it's first, Second Samuel 29, 21 9 is where you'll find that. And that uh, he had he had about three sons. I think that's what I found was three sons, and they were giants. So when David picked up five stones, you know, he had Goliaths. I've heard this preached several ways, but now factually I can tell you this much. He had Goliath, then he had his brother Lami, and then he had at, at, at least three sons that were giants, and so he had enough to take care of everybody. Isn't that cool? And David, if, if I remember correctly, I think I'm remembering this correctly, David didn't kill the other giants. His mighty men did. David trained up and raised up a, a, a war machine of giant killers. Are, are you all following this? This is pretty awesome. In John 10.10, 10, we know this verse all too well. It says, The thief cometh not except for to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, but I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And yes, there is a host of of evils that are assigned against you. Many are the afflictions. Many are the raws, R-A, that are being appointed against you. But I shall deliver you out of them all, every one of them. And so, yeah, we're facing, if if the election goes this way, it could be horrible for our nation. It could be horrible. But if it goes the other way, and you know, this thing of when we were facing Neil Gorsuch being appointed, I, I was like, oh, my goodness, my focus was on the president. But maybe he was raised up to appoint uh, uh, Supreme Court justices. And, and so then it made the reality of the, the significance of what he was in there for was even bigger than I had even had in my mind and I believe that we're going to see things unfold that's going to be even more and more and more so and the president has actually given us the freedom to speak about political issues from the pulpit where before that was not that was not uh, uh, legal to do that so yeah he definitely is our friend and there is a war and it's not political it is spiritual amen but the opponents They don't want to get even. They want revenge, and they want to annihilate the enemy. And I said it wasn't over because Goliath had a brother and some sons at least. He may have had other brothers that we just don't have record of that I'm not aware of. But there's others out there who want to join the force. They want to join in. And so we see that the, the, what's going on is there is a machine, a war machine that's been building for two years. We're going to take down this president. It, it's been going on, guys, and it's been, and they're coming back with a vengeance. They're coming back with a roar. And Lance said in one part in here, I, didn't, I walked out for a moment to check something in my book, but he said that every midterm elections that the conservatives lose seats. And he said, Every term, midterm, it always happens. How many believe it's time for that to stop? It's time for that to come to a, to a complete stop and actually reversal. I'm believing for that. I'm believing for that. Hallelujah. Now, guys, just hang with me. If you happen to be liberal in your political views, you're going to have to forgive me because Jesus tells, has said you won't go to heaven if you don't. Have you heard of the, Larry mentioned last week, the deep state? Anybody heard of that? 
the deep state or the shadow government is another term. It is political people that are, they were in power mostly. They've gotten out. They've used both their terms up or they're out or they're, uh, they got voted out. But they're behind the scenes pouring their money, their resources, their influence, trying to manipulate and change and, and, and unearth every kind of uh, destructive uh, media that they can find, anything they can to discredit, dishonor the, the people that are, that are in power now. And it's, it's behind the scenes. It's in the shadows. And you don't see it, but I've heard, I've heard the last two uh, liberal presidents, I've heard their names are very, very active in this. And I'm going to tell you guys, there is a war going on. And it's, it's, it's bigger, it's, it's more real than anything that I've ever seen in the political arena. Now, isn't it something the enemy uses politics to try to eliminate? It started with Jesus. Herod tried to take him out. And then they brought him before Pontius Pilate, who, was, who gave him, uh, assigned him his death, death, whatever, sentenced him to death. And so we see the same thing today. It hasn't changed. The enemy knows uh, in areas that he's good at fighting. All right? So this is a spiritual battle. It is not political. What can we do? In our nation or our state, um, we have one senator right now. I'll t- if you want to know his name, I'll tell you. He is very liberal. He's like a carbon copy of Hillary Clinton. And if you'd like to know who that is, I'll let you know. He needs to be voted out. The conservatives have a margin of one vote uh, in the Senate and not much more in the House. And it's, getting, it's, it's very much is, is resting upon this. Some may say, yeah, but if President Trump gets impeached, we get Mike Pence. Right? Isn't that how it goes? Do you think Mike Pence is going to escape warfare? I mean, they're already saying, this guy says God talks to him. Have you heard that? They're out there bashing him already, saying, this guy is a whack job. He thinks God talks to him. Well, then he talked to you. What's wrong with you? Aren't you you hearing God? Yes, God speaks. Yes, God speaks to his people. Aren't you glad he does? They call Jesus a liar, a deceiver. They call him a false prophet. Did they call him an antichrist? I don't remember. They called him everything under the sun. You think that, that what they did to Jesus, Jesus said, if they did it to me, they'll do it to you. You think that Mike Pence is going to escape any of that? He's squeaky clean. He is squeaky clean. And he has made it very clear that his first priority is God. And his second is his family. And his third is his job. He's made it very clear. We watched the video in here months and months and months ago. And so he has got his very clear record that they can attack and assail just bam, 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 just like they have been doing with our current president. You think it's going to get better? The battle is on. It's on. And if the souls of mankind hang in the balance, it's not just about who's in power. When the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. But when the righteous are in authority, people rejoice. It has a way of affecting the whole nation. And it has a way of affecting the the outcome of people's faith even. People can get twisted and flip-flopped according to who's in office and says whatever they want to say. It's crazy, but it happens like that. All right. I'm almost finished, so just hang with me. Is there a healing bomb in Gilead? Have you all seen that? Is there a healing bomb in Gilead? It's in the Bible. It's there a healing bomb. Kim Clement, anybody remember him? Prophet of God. He prophesied that Trump would be elected long before he was ever a candidate. Before his name was ever thought of or heard much other than in the uh, big business end of it. He prophesied that he would be filled with the Spirit of God while in office, right? That he would be a praying man. He prophesied that he would be reelected. Now, Right? I, yeah. 
He, I've heard that from various sources. Larry, when we went out to lunch last week, he was saying, okay, so we got Trump for four years, and he's going to be reelected for four, and then we're going to get Pence for eight years. That's 16 years of, of you know, some form of godliness or godliness. I mean, that's pretty awesome to have a man like Mike Pence as the vice president, influencing the president to whatever degree. Is it, is it all that easy? Because somebody prophesied, is that, is that a done deal? Is there, do we have any responsibility in this? My goodness, church, if we don't pray, if we don't stand, if we don't stand against the, the floodgates of hell that are being unleashed on our nation, and you watch the last couple of weeks before the election, it's going to get nasty. It is going to get nasty. You know how short the, the Americans' memory is. And they like to bring up lots of ugly things days, weeks before the election. It's going to get ugly. But we need to pray and that every weapon that is formed against us and for those that are leading us shall not prosper. We do have an answer, and it's found. It's the same. I don't know about you all, but I... I have not stopped praying it. I prayed it six months before the election. I'm still praying it. Second Chronicles 7.14. It, it holds answers for nations. If, it starts off with if. What does if mean? It means it could go this way, it could go that way. It depends on how you'll hear the rest of the verse. If my people, if my people, my people, who are that? Who are they? The believers, believers, if my people. And he said that, he, that and Lance Wall now was saying that there's these special kind of dumb people who are trying to uh, uproot our president, special kind of dumb. Isn't that kind of cool? <laughs> I got to remember that. Special kind of stupid is what I'd like to say. Special kind of stupid people. Okay, so we have if my people, if. So that means they may pray and they may not. It's, it's all contingent upon what we do. I put an article on, on Facebook a couple years back. I said it's really not about who's in power. It's about what the Christians do. If my people humble themselves and pray and turn from their evil, wicked ways, quit watching the porno, quit getting all the stuff on the Internet that we don't have any need to be getting into, Quit slandering your neighbor. Quit gossiping about people. Quit stealing from work. Quit cheating your neighbor. Start living right. Start doing the right things. If my people, he's talking about his own people, if my people will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. He's, he's not talking about the world. He's talking about his people. Those who go by his name, Christians, believers, followers of Jesus. If my people will do this. And pray and seek my face. Turn their wicked ways. He said, I will hear from heaven. He's promised us. He's just waiting on us to call upon his name. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? He's promised us that he will hear and respond and he will answer. I will hear your prayer. I will forgive your sin. How many knows that's awesome? And I will heal your land. How I many knows that is amazing? When it all it has to happen for all that to happen is for God's people to lay our sins down, to repent, to get our lives right with God, start walking in a holy way, and call upon Him. Our opinions, yeah, yep. I may have to lay a few of those down too. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. I'm going to finish where I started. This is, this is a closing. For you that are watching online, if you uh, dis, dislike our president, I'm sorry. This is not a political message. This is a spiritual message. And I hope you don't take this to heart in, a, in an offensive way. But if offense comes, then I know that 
Sometimes the preaching of a cross is offensive. Sometimes holiness is offensive. 2 Corinthians 10.14 says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strength. Tells us right off the bat, we have weapons. God has given us weapons. And we see that in Ephesians 6, that we have the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. We have the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the best plate of righteousness, our loins covered with truth, feet shod with the preparation readiness of the gospel of peace. Did I say shield of faith? So we have all these tools, and we have uh, some that are not listed there is just is prayer, obedience, faith. That's the shield of faith. They're offensive and de- defensive weapons. They're given to us on both sides, but there's no retreating weapons. Okay? The warfare, now this is cool. If you take notes, write this down. The weapons of our warfare, the war- word warfare is the Greek word stratos. From that word, we get strategy. Okay, you can have all the tanks and all the cannons and all the airplanes in the world. If you got no strategy, you're probably going to get blown off the map. You have to have a battle plan. And you know when God, and then it goes on to say, the weapons of warfare are not carnal. That is sarcos, is the word sarcos. And it's a kissing cousin to the word sarx, which means flesh. The works of the flesh are lead to death. And that is the sarcos has to be with anything that originates in the heart, the thoughts of man. So it's not, what it's saying is the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not originated in man, but they're spiritual. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And this thing, we, and he gives us strategies how to fight. Now, when we fight, how many knows God gives some really weird strategies? Things that just don't make sense. They're not carnal. They're not rooted in our, uh, in, in our line of thinking. Like, how many knows that if, if I was going to have a battle scene, if we were going to engage in battle with swords or whatever, I'd put John on the front line and Big Steve up there, have Andy with him. <laughs> Look the women to the rear, and I'd be back there behind the women. <laughs> I'm going to put, put Jacob in there, and Guadra, put them right up there in the front line, and say, get them. <laughs> if that didn't work, I'd touch him every now. I'm behind you. Go ahead. Get them. But God didn't operate like that. He put the worshipers in front, right? He said, now go out and sing about the praise, the beauty of his holiness man they went out and they sing praise ye the lord his work go work his what is it it's something endures forever mercy endures forever and ever yeah <laughs> that's what they were doing <laughs> so god's plans don't always match up our strategy doesn't always match his like well we're gonna call the white house and we're gonna get a contingency of people we're gonna go up there and we're gonna storm the white house and we're gonna drop leaflets all over the nation or whatever and he's like Maybe not. Not gonna do that. <clears throat> what about the one where David's like, okay, what do we do now, God? They just got their butts kicking AI. He said, What are we gonna do? God says, He says, Should we do you want to go frontal attack? You want to go around to the end? And God says, wait till you hear the sounding and the marching in the mulberry tree. You hear troops up in the air, man. Can you imagine the angelic coast? It's like boom, boom, boom. They're up there and they're up there in the and it sounds like they're in the treetops. The angels are marching, man. They're kind of showing up on the scene. It's when you hear the angels, when you hear that marching in the sound of the mulberry trees, get them. The angels are here. Go at them then. Yeah, can you see that? And every time that God gives some kind of a weird, a weird you know, pay taxes, go out and throw your line into this river, and you're going to catch a fish, and in its mouth will be your tax money. Yikes! Who would have thought that would be something you'd... Who would have thought of that? But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The strategies that we have are not... Or they don't originate in my mind or your mind. They, they, we call upon the name of the Lord, and He's the one that gives us strategies, and He says, I want you all to get together, and I want you to pray, and I want you to fast, and I want you to declare... And I want you to do this, and I want you to do that, and I want you to get out and say, what are we 
throwing this oil all over the streets for? Because I told you to. And make declarations over your city. Go to the capital and pour oil all over the place. You might get arrested. Throw it on the doors. You know, you don't want to do that. <laughs> but God tell me knows that his strategies aren't always ours. But I'm going to tell you, they work. When we obey God, they work. And I believe that even though that the opponents of right, the opponents of righteousness, I'm going to tell you that you all may not know this. You may not know this. They don't just hate President Trump. They hate y'all. They do. Anybody who carries the name of Christ. When Hillary Clinton, I saw a quote that she said, Christians are going to have to change the way they think about abortion. It wasn't enough that they're trying to control our actions or how we vote, but they want to control how we think. That's getting into the real control issues there, guys. That's serious stuff. And I'm telling you that hell, there will be hell to pay, or there could be hell to pay, or there could be an unleash of glory in our land. And I really honestly believe it's in our hands. It's in our hands. We come in agreement with God's, what God said, do what God says. It's a done deal. It's over. I don't care if this, every midterm election this has happened or that's happened. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. God's bigger than voting patterns of the United States population. How many agrees with that? He doesn't care how people vote. You know, it's, somebody says, I pull this. He says, click. He gives a different vote. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know, I know. We're not going to go there. That's already been a big issue on the <laughs> All right, I'm excited because I want to see God glorified in our land. I want to see this happen. I'm not, I'm not pushing Republicans. Please don't under, please understand that. I don't. I vote for righteousness. That's how I vote. True. I vote for righteousness. I don't vote for if they're Republican or Democrat. I vote for what is right in, in the eyes of God. And we do know that under the previous, well, even under your role, it started under the previous administration. When we embrace homosexual marriages, when we legalize the murder of children, and it's over 60 million children have died, something has got to change. Something has got to change. We have the potential. If, if the enemy works in the political realm, and the Bible says that, when the righteous bear authority, people rejoice. That says a lot to me. So we need to make sure that we put the righteous or the closest thing to righteous people. I, I don't like to say that President Trump is a Christian. If he is, he's just needing a lot of fine-tuning. Yeah, don't we all? I don't know. I don't know if he is or not. I know he believes in a lot of the same things. Yeah, well, I like to think that. I like to go along with that, that very thing, but I'm not going to stand up for I don't know. I don't know his, I don't know him personally. I don't know anything about him other than what I read or hear. Let's stand on our feet. <clears throat> war in the heavenlies, guys. There's a war going on in the heavenlies. And we need to be a people that we don't abandon our post at a season when the enemy is trying to sl slip in under the the cloak or the, the cover of darkness. How many knows he works best in darkness? He does. We need to be people who will stand fast and declare and proclaim. And we're going to make it a point. Uh, we've been doing it some, but I really feel like we need to do it Mondays when the saints gather together, prayer, to make that a primary, one of the primary objectives, not the primary objective, because Holy Spirit may have something else. We want to follow him. But our nation, 
Our nation hangs in the balance, guys. <clears throat> but whatever it's worth, if you have an email to send me, if you want to complain, it's ba McCullum at <laughs> what is it at what dot com at what dot com? Yeah, you heard that. So send it, send it. Yeah, she filters all my hate mail. <laughs> All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you. You are our keeper. You are our keeper. You're the one who keeps us. You said in your words in 1 Thessalonians that you would keep us spirit, soul, and body until the coming of the Lord. You are the one who keeps us. It's not a political party. It's not our own abilities. You are our keeper. Father, and so we look to you today, and we call upon the name of the Lord. And we know that no matter how anything settles, the bottom line is you are our keeper. And so, Father, we look to you, and we call upon you. We know that our nation is on the verge of something that could be a crisis, or it could be a Christ, uh, glory to Christ. And so, Father, I pray for our nation. I pray, God, that you will cause this midterm election to be something that leaves the enemies of the, of the gospel and enemies of the right, what is right, not the right wing, but what is right. I pray, God, that you will cause there to be a shaking of heads, scratching of heads, consternation, like what in the world just happened? I pray, God, that you're going to cause our nation to be a one nation under God again. We are believing for the salvation of multiplied millions, millions upon millions of people who are walking in darkness. They just don't know. They haven't heard the truth. For our Father, for those who have heard it and rejected it and are violently opposed to it, Lord, we leave that into your hands for you to deal with them. Father, we pray for this nation to turn around. We pray, God, that the freedoms that we have as believers in this nation that have increased in the last two years will continue to increase. We pray, God, that we will respond well to favor from on high, that we will uh, take up the sword, that we will take up the, the, the dance, that we will take up the worst songs of worship, whatever you would have us to do, but we will be faithful to execute the directions from heaven. We will be faithful to declare, to do, and to be who you've called us to be. We love you this morning, God. We are calling out on behalf of our neighbors, of the people that uh, are, are different, different nationalities within our country, different races within our country, different everything, different ways of thinking. We're calling out on behalf of every one of them, God. We're praying for their salvation, oh God. And we look to you, God. Your word said that the nation that forgets God shall be turned into hell. But Lord, this is not a nation that is forgetting you because we are declaring, we're calling for righteousness. Sin is a reproach to any people, but righteousness exalts a nation. And I pray, God, that we will be a nation that turns back to righteousness, and this nation will be exalted because of that. We give you thanks and praise for all that you've done. In Jesus. I um, always feel kind of funny when I do messages like this. If you have a need that is um, on the lines of just personal needs, healing, uh, battle, struggles that you're going through, just come on up here. We'll pray with you. We're not going to leave on just all that stuff that I just spoke about. But if you have a need, make sure you come up here. We'll pray with you and believe God will.